welcome everyone. So I'm really happy to be able to introduce Denise Costanza today uh, and I want to tell you a little bit about her. Dr. Costanzo is an assistant professor of history and theory in the Department of Architecture at the Pennsylvania State University. Her research investigates 20th century architectural history and theory. Her first book, What Architecture Means, Connecting Ideas and Design, uh, was published in 2016, and then a Chinese edition appeared uh, in 2017. It offered a thematic introduction to architectural theory. Her current book project, I believe it's a current book project, uh, Modern Architects and the Post-War Rome Prize, is a multinational analysis of the changing significance of Rome and its national academies during the Cold War, based on the work of American, French, British, and Spanish architects. For this project, she was awarded the Marion and Andrew D. High School Rome Prize in Modern Italian Studies at the American Academy in Rome for 2014 and 2015. Dr. Costanzo has published in the Journal of the Society of Architectural Historians, the Journal of Architecture, the Memoirs of the American Academy in Rome, and in the Journal of Architectural Education, and her essays also appear in <coughs> edited volumes. Um, so uh, with no further ado, uh, Today, Dr. Costanzo will be speaking on um, Robert Venturi. Uh, I'll let her say more about that, but please help me welcome. Thank you, Joan. Thank you all. It's a real pleasure to be in this beautiful place uh, in such a beautiful season, and uh, thank you for the chance to be here. And I'll be happy to explain how I ended up in this rather weird topic. It's a little bit of a detour from the main current of what I work on. Um, but for now, let's just take a look at this truly awful object <laughs> and see what we think of it. Okay. I'm still figuring that out for myself, for the record. So when you drive on Interstate 95, hold on, let me get, it's not quite advancing. The arrow keys? Huh? I'm using the arrow keys. There we are. Okay, from there, and then here. Starting over. When you drive along Interstate 95 uh, up Philadelphia's eastern edge, if you look in the right direction, at the right moment, you might catch a glimpse of a very odd form. It rises over 32 meters above the Delaware Riverfront at Penn's Landing, but its pinnacle is only visible from the freeway for just a moment before the road dips underground for several blocks. It's harder to miss from the slower four-lane road that runs between the freeway and the park where this object stands, or when approaching from the water. From any vantage point, though, its profile is distinctive, a vertical tapering pillar that rises to a point, crowned by a spire, skewering an orb and a stiff banner. The silhouette is ancient, a form invented by the Egyptians for the colossal granite monoliths that they hewed and raised to flank the entrances to their sun god's temples. The Egyptians' term for these wonders was teken, or that which pierces. The name we use, obelisk, is Greek for little skewer. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. Obelisks are, by definition, solid, four-sided stones culminating in a small period or pyramidion placed upright to point at the sky, needles that stitch together heaven and earth. The curious Philadelphia pillar that we see obviously participates in this long formal tradition. But this form is also just as obviously not an obelisk. Instead of one solid mass, it consists of eight open boxes, folded flat planes separated by wide horizontal gaps. They define an inner void that at night is brightly lit to create an oxymoronic obelisk as lantern. 
Its crowning pyramidion is just a fleeting impression produced by flat vertical triangles on each of its sides, each of its three sides, not four. This geometry also violates the prototype because any true obelisk is square in plan and its sides are aligned with the cardinal directions and the sun's eternal path. But the Philadelphia version is an extruded equilateral triangle and its orientation is unclear. The colossal brick and stone compass rows beneath the base highlights the formal tension between the riverfront side of the triangle, which faces not quite east, and the apex opposite, which is a bit off west. Like a compass's wobbly needle, it doesn't point do anything. What then does this odd non-obelisk indicate? So that apex does offer one immediate clue. A rotating, it does rotate, rigid weather vane banner has a green, white, and red vertical tricolor on one side, two horizontal bands framing a yellow one on the other. Obviously the flags of Italy and Spain. So this hint about the object's purpose is confirmed by the base, which has the name Christopher Columbus inscribed on all three sides in huge red and blue font. I used a picture with me in it just for scale. It is hard to understand from photos how massive this thing is. So, and the dates in yellow above that, 1492 to 1992. So whatever else this enormous pseudo obelisk is, it definitely commemorates the 500th anniversary of Columbus's fateful arrival in the New World at a scale meant to be legible from a good distance. On one side only, there's slightly smaller text beneath that giant technicolor name, which reads, Cinquecento Anniversary. Columbus, intrepid navigator, with a sense of the sea unparalleled before or after him. A native son of Genoa, he became, through his dedication to a dream, an honored hero of history. His keen intellect, abiding faith, an undaunted persistence made him a giant among men of his millennium. So after we roll our eyes, clutch our stomachs, whatever the reaction is, um, we can read text on the other side, which explains who's responsible for making this laudatory proclamation in the structure itself. It was erected by the America 500 Corporation. And the third side, which we don't see here, says special thanks to our corporate sponsors. At the bottom of all three sides, the very smallest font names about another 100 individuals, couples, and families. A predominance of Italian names among these confirms an association that's implicit in the use of Cinquecento over Quincentennial and the mention of Columbus's birth city. The monument was a product of Philadelphia's Italian community, and the America 500 Corporation, despite its national, very generic name, was made up primarily of local Italian-American executives, politicians, and lawyers. A line above the smallest names on all three sides, this gets repeated throughout, uh, declares their motivation, and that reads, in honor of all our forebearers who braved the journey to America and their American descendants. Importantly, it doesn't specify which immigrants, although it does explicitly <coughs> exclude those who were already inhabiting the continent and those who came involuntarily. But clearly, we know from this that the donors wish to commemorate their collective heritage by way of Columbus. This was an established connection for New World Italians throughout the hemisphere who had leveraged the explorer's fame since the 19th century. In the US, Columbus, became, Columbus Day became a federal holiday in 1937 after an Italian American led campaign to claim participation in a national identity traditionally equated with Protestant faith and Northern European heritage. So 
This Columbus Monument was an extension of this same project for public recognition, using one famous Italian name to create space for countless others. Two other tiny, now faded names, oh here we have, sorry, the classic Columbus Day Parade. Two tiny, now faded names uh, on the monument are also famous in their own way, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown who are spouses with a unique relationship to the monument. Their architecture firm designed it. Venturi, who was the project's lead designer, was an obvious choice for a group of Italian Americans wanting to claim a place in Philadelphia because he was one of their own. Born and raised there by a family of immigrants from Abruzzo and Puglia, he practiced from the city for his entire half-century career. Venturi arose to international prominence in the 1960s. The house he designed for his mother, Vanna, in the Philadelphia suburb of Chestnut Hill is one of the 20th century's most iconic buildings. And his groundbreaking first book, Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture of 1966, was a pivotal postmodern manifesto that, along with learning from Las Vegas, which is co-authored in 1972 with Scott Brown and Stephen Eisenor, remains essential reading for architects. Two years after his firm was selected to design the Columbus Monument, Venturi won individually and controversial, controversially the 1991 Prisker Prize, Architecture's Nobel. So even though we're still debating the propriety of that singular award, America 500 at least must have been very pleased with this because how better to promote <coughs> the cause. So Philadelphia's most famous Italian-American architect was also known for connecting his ancestral nation to his work. Throughout his career, Venturi's extensive experience of Italy, its architectural lessons, and its influences on his own work were a persistent theme, from his 1950 master's thesis to his Pritzker acceptance speech. Even, surprising given its title, learning from Las Vegas applied Italian lessons to an American context directly by considering this hyper-automotive city through the lens of Rome. Although Venturi's most famous Philadelphia projects, both his mother's house and the Guildhouse senior apartments, quoted Italian architecture with segmental arches, and split pediments, and other references, the Columbus Monument was by far Venturi's most explicit design statement on Italian tradition in his home city. The client wanted an enduring urban sign that would show their descendants how they marked this momentous anniversary. The architect proposed the monument be an obelisk that had been updated formally, structurally, and symbolically for 1992. Venturi described this form as a traditional and accepted urban device, American and Italian. So what makes this Egyptian invention also Italian is the fact that one city possesses 13 ancient obelisks more than any other. Rome, famously so. Philadelphia's has three design elements that are specific to the Italian treatment of the form. One of these is its granite podium. <laughs> The Egyptians set obelisks on relatively low blocks, like you see here at Karnak, but all of the Italy's are elevated on very tall bases for greater visibility. <coughs> A second detail is that crowning orb. So this cites the bronze sphere that was added to one of the very first two obelisks that were brought to Rome by the Emperor Augustus in 10 BCE, uh, one of which became the gnomon of a giant sundial, so adding the uh, sphere on top made its point easier to read uh, for timekeeping. This was then copied by later emperors like Nero, who put one on top of the obelisk in his uh, circus, which is now uh, next to the Vatican, which we see here. And in fact, we have the sphere, the orb, and spire from that in the Vatican Museum. That's what we just saw. Um, so, a third orb-topped Italian obelisk. Oh, I just wanted to point out the very same obelisk that was in his uh, Augustus's sundial is the one that's now at the uh, Piazza Montecitorio in Rome. That and the one in the uh, Celimontana Park are two modern obelisks in Rome that have orbs on them today. They're ones that Venturi would have seen and known very, very well. 
There's another one topped with an orb in Florence, elsewhere in Italy, in the Boboli Gardens. That one was moved there from the Villa Medici in Rome. So the Boboli and Philadelphia obelisks share a third Italian detail, round forms supporting the shaft. So the one we see in Florence, as well as the 19th century copy that was placed where it had originally stood in Rome, both rest on little bronze turtles whose concave shelves uh, make the obelisk seem to float above its podium. These inspired neoclassical spheres, and we see that here in a British example made out of brick and stucco in a uh, garden. And these are the ancestors of Venturi's circles. He quoted these Italian traditions very carefully, yet his obelisk violates Roman practice at an urban scale. Ever since Pope Sixtus V had four obelisks moved to navigationally strategic positions across the city, they've been located in important plazas, major street intersections, or at the terminus of a large avenue. As the Philadelphia Inquirer's architecture critic Thomas Hine explained, whoops, an obelisk should serve as a point in space to create connections among distant places and perceptually pull people together. As he observed, the Columbus Monument does not do that. It is instead consigned to that city's far eastern edge. This is a map of 19th century Philadelphia which shows its historic core and this red circle, that's where the Columbus Monument is placed. That's not where Sixtus V would have wanted it to be placed. So its site in Spruce Creek Harbor Park at Penn's Landing, and I have it circled over there, is cut off from the city center by the four-lane Columbus Avenue, as well as I-95. We see it up there right before it ducks under the streets. And I am Pay's Society Hill Towers, which were built in the late 50s and early 60s. So this location was the architect's least preferred option out of five that he uh, proposed, and it was selected only after all the others were proven impractical. And even then, the obelisk had to be moved yet again. He initially wanted it to be put right on the road, which was originally called Delaware Avenue. So it was visible down at sidewalk level, and then the park above is a little bit elevated. You see that in an original section drawing. Instead, it ended up being moved inland and up. That final location is less visible, but it did inadvertently repeat one more obelisk tradition from Rome because it was originally occupied by a sundial. So the form's non-traditional three-sided geometry was also more of a circumstantial accident than a critical response to historic complexity. Initially, it had a square-shaped plan. That's the very earliest proposal that we know. That was flattened into a plus shape, and then this is a drawing prepared for construction beer, uh, bids, and that found the tripod option was more economical. So to save money, they went with that. The tripod then became an equilateral triangle and was actually shortened by six meters. It was supposed to be taller in order to cut costs hasten fabrication, and ensure completion by the all-important October 12th, 1992 deadline, a once in 500 year opportunity. And we see at the groundbreaking ceremony, this is still the old design. There are 10 layers instead of eight, so this is the taller design. It's a tripod, or at least it's ambiguous. They don't know which way they're going with that yet. And so we see that. Um, so the design was evolving, and so was the site design and orientation. When it was placed right along Columbus Avenue, and we see here a plan with the plus sign and then a plan, a plan with the tripod, it was part of a scheme that had uh, this world map theme to it, which evolved. It also had, when it became a tripod, one arm pointing due west, uh, essentially the direction of Columbus's voyage. And that also gave it maximum visibility from the road, not just for drivers, but the idea was the annual Columbus Day Parade, etc. So when the plan was shifted east, 
and inflated into a triangle, the alignment was rotated just slightly, making the east side parallel to the waterfront. So the unconventional geometry, which you see most clearly, I think, in a drawing like this, resulted from both a complex design process and a very tight budget. While the skewed orientation actually is there because it privileged the immediate context, the orientation of the park itself. Venturi insisted that context was what made the obelisk an American tradition as well. The nation's oldest one is an authentic, if suspiciously acquired, ancient Egyptian example, uh, which is installed in New York Central Park, it was put there in 1881. The nation's oldest obelisk-shaped monument is actually found in Baltimore, we see it on the right, uh, dates to 1792 and was the young nation's first homage to Columbus, erected to mark uh, his voyage as tricentennial, but not by an American, by the French consul. Venturi's team knew this appropriate precedent, but his proposal invoked only America's largest and most prominent example, when you probably may all be thinking of the Washington Monument. So just like Venturi's, it's also a pseudo-obelisk made of separate blocks. It's also hollow with that void in the core which allows visitors to access the observation platform up in the Pyramidion. All of the obelisks erected in early America incited heated public debates over whether a tyrannical form that was associated with pharaohs, emperors, and popes had any legitimacy in a republic. Venturi's obelisk also followed this tradition by generating intense controversy. The Columbus Monument's legal owner is the Delaware River Waterfront Corporation, and it's conceded that there have been many objections to the monument, including when it was built. Um, the critics have been vehement, but not very effective. Uh, I followed a change.org petition, which had been up until recently calling for its removal, and they finally took it down after only got 545 supporters, supporters for it. The objections have centered on two issues. One, obviously, is Columbus himself. Heroic accounts of his exploits dominated American consciousness for most of the 20th century, but it was starting around 1970 that narratives emphasizing his well-documented brutality and the catastrophic impact of his arrival on the New World's original occupants began gaining real traction. His legacy, which was long framed as a triumphant fulfillment of a design destiny to Christianize and Europeanize the Western Hemisphere, became associated with exploitation, genocide, and enslavement. This occurred as more attention was directed to minority rights and post-colonial cultural perspectives. Both of these fed resistance to celebrations of Columbus in US public life and public space, with many localities that began replacing Columbus Day with a holiday to honor indigenous peoples. This is an ongoing trend in the US for sure. By the 1992 anniversary, enthusiasm was quite limited. Despite an ardent campaign to, quote, reinvigorate the traditional heroic view of Columbus that included two Hollywood films. Ridley Scott directed that, okay, Gerard Depardieu. Um, museum exhibitions, replica ships sailing, sailing into New York Harbor. Basically, despite a lot of effort, the quincentennial celebration was a flop. Support for commemorating Columbus has waned only a lot further in the quarter century since. So now, obviously, the October 12th uh, holiday, quote unquote, usually brings protests as much as parades. <coughs> The Philadelphia obelisk's design has been almost as controversial <coughs> as its cause. Although the America 500 Corporation proudly called it a magnificent structure, and it even won a design award from the Pennsylvania Society of Architects, I don't know how, um, other critics have declared it not just ugly, but my favorite quote, the ugliest obelisk in the history of civilization. A lot of these are anonymous bloggers who may not be design experts, but the monument is undoubtedly ripe for critique. Its proportions are squat. 
the silhouette cartoonish and ideographic. Its cardboard cutout flatness is underscored by corner projections on the base that mark the profiles of absent moldings. And intersections of its supporting circles trace non-existent spherical volumes. Even the granite base is flat and planar, not solid. The text is inscribed onto about seven and a half centimeter thick stone panels attached to a concrete support. The top third of the base is even thinner, clad with the same stainless steel as the obelisk above. Whether or not this makes it ugly, it's a hard term to define sometimes, the monument is designed to look like a flat, hollow, contradictory knockoff. While earlier obelisk replicas mimicked the original's solidity and coherence, this one <coughs> deliberately flaunts its status as faux. Venturi and Scott Brown's work typically venerated the transcendent values embodied by Italy's architecture while also embracing an American commercial culture that values surface images over integrity and endurance. Here we see this in a contemporary project doing so in a particularly exuberant and playful way. To them, this was not a paradox. They saw the facades of Italy's historic cities and the automotive city's roadside signage both providing legible, mutable images for public consumption, separating a building's utilitarian enclosure from communication. Their very famous theoretical model of the decorated shed schematized this approach. Simple, flexible, economical built forms with an exterior made to adapt visual messages to new purposes are, in their view, most practical and honest, we would say today, resilient. The Columbus Monument openly communicates its own conflicted nature. And in fact, all of the design iterations, and we see them here, amazing collection of models in the archive, maintained the iconic profile and intended to use traditional stone while also expressing non-traditional industrial construction. I think the tension is most explicit in the penultimate design where we see offset joints between the metal panels that were quoting load-bearing masonry construction, while their diagonals reveal the supporting truss beneath. As it was built, that supporting truss was encased in a sheet metal envelope, an inner pylon that looked an awful lot like a traditional obelisk, as we see here in these construction photos, before the outer panels of bolted steel were installed. And now, if you look up, you have to look up into the monument to see the complexity of its fracture. The Columbus Monument was designed to celebrate its intrinsic incoherencies. If we do find it ugly, it may be because it looks too modern, or not modern enough, out of distaste for its cause, or some combination of these. Regardless, calling it that would really not bother the architects. They had embraced the epithets ugly and ordinary as a badge of honor. To them it meant that their work engaged reality in all of its messy complexity. Ambivalence was a quality that Venturi had celebrated since complexity and contradiction through another Italian legacy, one he and Scott Brown found appropriate for the many unresolved complexities of modernity, mannerism. The 16th century artistic category integrated erudite <coughs> sophistication, rule breaking, and irony. <coughs> the Columbus obelisk undoubtedly uses sophisticated knowledge and breaks rules, but is it ironic? To use this term precisely, a statement must signify its opposite and, importantly, express this contradiction knowingly through tone. How do we establish this here with architecture in general? So one way is through a comparison with other works. An especially appropriate candidate in this case is an earlier Venturi project located near Penn's Landing. It's just a couple blocks away, Franklin Court. Uh, this memorial to another historic figure, Benjamin Franklin, was completed for another major anniversary, the U.S. Bicentennial of 1976. 
It resurrects Franklin's lost home and printing office on their original site, presenting the missing buildings as white metal outlines that sketch generic forms. The historic site is reconstructed in a legible way, but as ghostly absence. It outlines both buildings and non-buildings. This is a textbook case of architectural ambiguity with architectural ironies galore, in particular between an explicitly modernist white metal structure and postmodern iconographic imagery. But the design reinscribes Franklin into the city without questioning his importance. I would say here that the monument's purpose is treated unambiguously and unironically. Its tone is sincere, irony's opposite. A very different attitude can be detected at a more distant monument by another architect, one whose purpose is much closer to the Columbus obelisk. The Piazza d'Italia in New Orleans by Charles Moore was built to inscribe another Italian-American community into civic public space. It's Italy-shaped fountain, uh, which is hard to see. This is Sicily right here, so Italy is kind of rolling down this way, and you see it up there in plan. Uh, that fountain anchors what is basically a really cheesy stage set of Technicolor neon lit campaniles, pediments, arcades, colonnades, all clearly, if generically, Italian architectural elements. We have text here as well, but it's far less legible. What it says is that this fountain of St. Joseph was given by the citizens of New Orleans to everyone. But using Latin makes that democratic message elite and exclusive. Moore's collage of overstuffed references pointedly proclaims not generic ownership, but glorious Italian cultural heritage. But it puts this in quotation marks, exaggerating their superficiality. The flamboyant artifice highlights how absurd it is to install an Italian piazza in Louisiana. The message here is unambiguously ironic. It winks at us, saying, this place where you are can't really exist. It's like a theme park constructing a transparently theatrical, inauthentic site that leverages architectural symbols but doesn't question their meaning. The Columbus Monument's design approach, I would say, is different from both. It uses legible form while simultaneously subverting its meaning with unorthodox geometry, hollowness, brokenness, and iconoclastic details. The gap between the base and those supporting circles takes that tradition of obelisk levitation to an absurd limit. And other gaps expose the structural illusion by revealing the supporting pylon beneath. The architect <coughs> architects even highlight the paradox by calling the shafts horizontal separations mortar joints in scare quotes. They use the scare quotes. Applying a unit masonry term to a form synonymous with joint-free stone built of stainless steel diaphragms hung on an internal metal sheath truss can only be ironic. So is their phrase, obelisk <coughs> in modern form. But unlike the Piazza d'Italia's parade of cacophonous elements, the Columbus Monument distills its complexity into one condensed form that acts, remains intact as urban gestalt, <coughs> while violated in its essence. Its ironies derive from the fun of simultaneously following and inverting the rules of a game, while the Piazza d'Italia instead treats the game as a joke. We see these different attitudes most clearly in their respective ironic columns. Ha ha. Uh, Venturi has insubstantial wood slats enveloping a weight-bearing core, so cladding functional support with flat surface. Moors literally, and to me kind of creepily, decapitated capitals can't support anything. They hang all sculpted, materially mysterious, fictive form with no structural substance. 
Did Venturi choose a dignified form for the Columbus Monument, then subvert its dignity, not only to update it, but because he also viewed its purpose ironically? We might think so from a detail you may have already noticed, the strike throughs in two key lines of text on the base, those dates and the name Columbus. These seem to at once declare and erase the obelisk's official pretext. But unfortunately, that's a graphic design device that appears in other less problematic projects. So I'm not sure how convincing that one detail is. The division of the name Columbus is not just visual, however. It's an interface of two materials, traditional stone beneath and industrial modern steel above. So Christopher and the top third of Columbus appear tied to the obelisk superstructure, but it and the granite beneath are actually both applied panels that could just be popped off and replaced. Change dedications would surely dismay those who paid a lot of money to get their names carved in stone here. Um, the monument's purpose, according to America 500's president, was to remind our great-grandchildren of what we did to observe this anniversary. Yet instead of a solid marker meant to survive the ages, the client got one that proclaimed its own emptiness and impermanence. More like a three-faced, illuminated sign of an obelisk than the thing itself, as the Philadelphia architecture critic Thomas Hine observed. The design brazenly defies the client's intent, yet the architect's name is also on that base. There's also a lot of other evidence that Venturi sincerely supported the monument's cause. As it neared completion, he added to a press release, this is in his own handwriting on a document, we are thrilled to be working on this fascinating and unusual project. Even more compellingly, the obelisk was actually the firm's second project for a Columbus monument in Philadelphia. Three years before that proposal, in 1985, uh, they proposed two palazzo-inspired walls on the edge of a park in the city's traditionally Italian neighborhood connecting different symbols from the peninsula's architectural history to that local community. This was a connection that Venturi had explored in his own way many times. He connected historic precedents and his own immigrant origins through his early travels to Italy. He was also devoted to his family. After his dad became too ill, to keep working in the 1950s, he simultaneously managed his family's wholesale, wholesale produce business for about two decades while he was also beginning his career as an architect. So this gave him very direct familiarity with Philadelphia's Italian-American commercial community. But he was both part of that Italian world and separate from it. His mother became a Quaker and raised her son in what has to be the most un-Catholic and most Philadelphian faith. That was William Penn's uh, religious affiliation. Now, Venturi always attributed this to her intellectual interests and political views. She was very much a socialist and a, a liberal. Uh, but it was also very much an act of social differentiation, away from their immigrant roots and towards the city's elites. So Venturi existed both within and apart from Philadelphia's Italian-American community. <laughs> However this affected Venturi's view of his fellow local Italians, we can be pretty sure his embrace of the Columbus Project was not only reflexive loyalty to an ethnic figurehead. I'll point out too that Quakers are traditionally pacifists and he was a conscientious objector who did not serve in World War II. It's a pretty unusual position at the time. Now, he couldn't predict, there was no way you could predict, that another name on the monument's base, the Honorable, oh, here's his family, and the uh, Venturi logo from the business. 
We see the name of the Honorable Vincent J. Fumo, who is a state senator, who in 2009 was convicted of 137 federal counts of corruption. Um, he had no way to predict that, but with his business experience, he surely understood what I will euphemistically call the Italian community's complex position in the city's networks of power. We do know, however, that he personally tempered the celebratory text that we see on the monument. Uh, the original draft of this was written by the president of America 500, the attorney Andrew Farnese, who basically read Columbus's navigational logs and developed this very purple prose from it. Um, and it was known in Venturi's firm, in the architecture firm, to be the most politically charged part of the monument. So Venturi deleted the rather um, impressive modifiers in phrases like incredible navigator, meticulous mathematician, and committed Christian. He strikes through those in the correspondence. And in fact, the last phrase was fortunately eliminated entirely. He also, interestingly, in the draft, wanted to strike through the word honored in honored hero of history. But that one stayed. Another body that had approval over the monument, the Philadelphia Art Commission, also had concerns with both the acclamatory language and its design. It discussed with some concern the obelisk's inescapably phallic form, which is very much enhanced by those supporting circles, um, but they did let that pass. However, one member did ask the monument to somehow acknowledge those who were already inhabiting in the continent when Columbus arrived. Um, unfortunately, this never materialized, but the commission did withhold approval until the inscriptions were finalized. Their main concern overall was seeing an ethnic monument at Penn's Landing. Um, hence that language regarding immigration, which becomes a little more generic. But for the client, of course, this was the whole point. America 500's goal was to place Italian Americans at the heart of a city whose major symbols all signified WASP control. Their fundraising brochure had insisted that the project would glorify the contribution of Italian Americans to Philadelphia. It promises that the monument would honor the achievements of the Italian community and inspire future generations to revere Columbus. Those never quite made it onto the base, but they can still be read between the inscribed lines. If the carved text fulfills the client's wishes only obliquely, the same can be said for its form. Both client and architect wanted the immense monument whose famous form is associated with empire and colonial control to also be somehow welcoming to the public. But its treatment as a pictographic silhouette is both recognizable and cartoonish, complete with what I see as inverted Mickey Mouse ears, those circles. Um, if the client was concerned about accessible crossing over into irreverence, Venturi could have invoked Italian tradition once more, since this was anything but reverential toward obelisks. These had been dragged, shipped, crowned with foreign objects, re-inscribed, and even subjected to exorcism rituals. Rome's emperors and popes took obelisks, real and faux, and made them their own, freely modifying and remaking an ancient sacred form to announce brand new beliefs and dominions. So the form holds in abeyance two sets of contradictory values, a perennial wish to pin together earthly and divine power in a solid, eternal way, and a historic reality of mutability, mobility, and brokenness. The crazing pattern on the first venturi design, which you see on the left, and the conspicuous gaps in later ones remind us that all of Italy's ancient obelisks, save one, the Vatican, have been shattered and reassembled from fragments, at once solid and broken. Venturi, I would insist, 
made these associations intentionally. But what is less clear is whether his ironic design indicates scorn for the project's purpose. He certainly knew it was superfluous in one important respect. The city's Italian Americans already had a monument to Columbus in the very same South Philadelphia park where Venturi proposed the first Columbus monument. Three years before that project, in 1982, a 19th century portrait of Columbus, the only one that was in the city, was moved there from Fairmount Park, and that's when they added the cheesy ships, I'm sure. Um, this brought Columbus into the Italian neighborhood, but it kept both peripheral to Center City. Venturi wanted his obelisk, his first choice location, was to be at the intersection of Washington and Broad, where it would visibly interrupt a primary urban axis and also stand much closer to Philadelphia's epicenter at City Hall. So to give you a sense of the geography, City Hall is right there, up in the blue circle. That's where the uh, monument sits now. This is Marconi Plaza. The wall proposal was for this southern edge. That is Washington and Broad. Okay, so that was his first choice location. The final waterfront site, as you can see, is about the same distance uh, from City Hall. And it also fulfilled the client's desire for nautical associations. They really wanted to be on the water. But it's far less visible. A vertical beacon only from along the water, from the park across the street. This is about as far away from it as you can get in the uh, Korean War Memorial Park or from along the road, as we saw in that first image. All this effort to make the 1992 Columbus Monument a conspicuous declaration that Italians were central, not marginal, to Philadelphia's history and culture was ironically being made as the community's claim to outsider status was becoming far less tenable. The influence it took to realize this controversial project belies any sense of exclusion that Italians held in a city that only erected its first public monument to an African American in 2017. That took a 120 year long campaign, although in the end it did secure a spot right by City Hall. The Columbus Monument supporters were overtly motivated by both his waning national cult and, probably less admittedly, the increasing presence of other ethnic groups in Philadelphia's halls of power during the 1980s. Another more recent irony is the fact that the Columbus Monument's 25th anniversary coincided with violent protests over Confederate monuments in Charlottesville, Virginia, and other locations in the US in 2017, as you all know well. Even before their outbreak, it was being called Philadelphia's own Confederate monument. What we see here is an opinion piece published in 2015. This fragmented, divisive obelisk's uncertain future will unfold amidst debates over public memorials embodying deep divisions in Americans' views of their own history, identity, and values. Certain remedies for problematic works, such as consigning them to museums, are simply impractical for a 32-meter project. If you know the Sagawin uh, totem at the ROM, of course, that's smaller, that's 24 meters, and the building was designed around it. If the monument's dedication does change, this would echo another controversial American broken obelisk by the artist Barnett Newman. The one installed in Houston, it's one of three that were made, was given a new dedication to Martin Luther King Jr. after his assassination in 1968. But the city rejected this new message for its public space. So it stands on private grounds. It's owned by the Menil Collection. Newman, like Venturi, translated Egyptian form into a broken metal ambivalent composition 
tied it in complex ways to American identity. Here too, meaning relies on tone. Newman's is unmistakably sincere. He conjoins abstract but ancient symbols of weight and ascension, darkness and light, death and life, tragedy and hope, into a statement of silent <coughs> sublimity. None of these words could ever apply to Venturi's broken obelisk. Even with new text or no text, it could never be serious or silent. Its superstructure, reminiscent of both a battleship and a sailing mast, with those porcelain enamel flags, would still testify to the original intent. But perhaps this is appropriate. Columbus's landing does remain a pivotal historic event with a five century global legacy. Unforgettable, even as how it is remembered evolves and should evolve. An ironic monument is one way to confront such overwhelming realities by acknowledging their complex impact without bowing to their authority. If Philadelphia's Columbus Monument survives another quarter century, we will see if it does, it will not be because it fulfilled its mission, but because it did not. Its position on an urban edge leaves the city's traditional epicenters at Independence Hall and City Hall unchallenged. It even suffers what has to be the most damning form of contemporary invisibility. If you search for Columbus Monument in Google, Google Maps, you don't find anything at Penn's Landing. So this seems impossibly by design. The architect gave Philadelphia an obelisk that does not pretend to be permanent or whole. That invites future re-inscription with new names and new meaning. The America 500 Corporation hoped its world-famous Italian-American Philadelphian architect would give form to their cultural identity. And he did, in unexpected and perhaps unintentional ways. Venturi's autobiographical design essay expressed his own ambivalence about a complex heritage. He gave his community and his city a monument to non-monumentality, a decorated shed of an obelisk imbued with ambition, modesty, and conflict, bombast wrapped around a void of doubt. These non-virtues may help it endure. We'll see. Thank you.